Eriks regarding the deployment of Russian troops near the border, since this all harms the Ukrainian economy. We do not need this panic, said President Zelensky. Rather, we need the, rather it, this is needed for those people who believe in the myth of the Russian aggression. The Ukrainian officials have talked about a lack of a, th a threat from Russia. In particular, this uh, pertains to the um, Minister of Defense, Mr. Uh, the President himself, Mr. Zelensky, who have said themselves that they do not see in this activity that uh, we are being talked about today as a threat. We are prepared to disseminate this to you later. We would urge all colleagues to not use the rostrum of the Security Council to push forward the propaganda beliefs of our colleagues. We would also like to remind members of the Security Council that the Russian delegation in December announced its plans to have an annual discussion of the situation in Ukraine during our presidency of the Council that starts from tomorrow. The seventh anniversary of the adoption of the packet of measures of the Minsk agreements will be an excellent opportunity for us to constructively uh, show the Security Council's commitment to uh, 2202 that is the international basis for the Ukrainian settlement. The event planned for, is planned for the 17th of February. If our American colleagues really need to say in public any uh, additional information about this, they can fully do this during the planned meeting in February. We would urge all sensible members of the Council not to support this provocative proposal and uh, treat the UN Charter with respect. Thank you. The representative of the Russian Federation, I give the floor to the representative of the US. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, as our colleague uh, stated, uh, we have called for this meeting. And we've called for this meeting uh, because of what we have all witnessed over the course of the past few months in terms of the actions of the Russian Federation on the territory of, uh, of uh, uh, on the border with Ukraine. Uh, they indicate uh, that uh, it's in their own territory, but it is also very uh, close to their neighbor's border. Uh, it's a neighbor that has been in, invaded already before. It's a neighbor that has uh, Russian troops occupying uh, their territory. Uh, we have had numerous meetings, uh, over 100 meetings over the course of the past few weeks, uh, both with uh, Russian officials and in consultations with our European and Ukrainian colleagues. All of these meetings have been in private. We think it's now time to have a meeting in public uh, and uh, have uh, this discussed in a public forum. Uh, we have uh, worked with the Ukrainians uh, at their request uh, to provide assistance to them so that they can prepare for what they see as inevitable, uh, including having provided $200 million uh, in assistance in recent weeks and over $5 billion in assistance since 2014. And that is so that they can be uh, prepared. Uh, you have heard from our Russian colleagues that we're calling for uh, this meeting to make you all feel uncomfortable. Imagine how uncomfortable you would be if you had 100,000 troops sitting on your border uh, in the uh, way that these troops are sitting on the border with Ukraine. Uh, for us, this is about peace and security. It's about honoring the uh, UN Charter uh, that calls of, uh, on us as members of the Security Council to protect peace and security. So this is not about antics, uh, it's not about rhetoric, it's not about U.S. and Russia. What this is about is the peace and security of, uh, of one of our member states. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United States. In view of the request, 
and the comments made by members of the Security Council, I intend to put the provisional agenda to a vote. Accordingly, I shall put it to the vote now. Will those in favor of the adoption of the provisional agenda please raise their hand? Those against? Abstention? The result of the voting is as follows. 10 votes in favor, two votes against, three abstentions. The provisional agenda has been adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council Provisionals Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Belarus, Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Ms. Rosemary Di Carlo, Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, to participate in the meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. Recalling the Security Council late, latest note 507 on its working methods, I wish to encourage all speakers, both members and non-members of the Council, to deliver the statements in five minutes or less. Note 507 also encourages briefers to be succinct and to focus on key issues. In this spirit, briefers are further encouraged to limit their initial remarks to seven to ten minutes. Everyone is also encouraged to wear a mask at all times, including while de delivering remarks. I now give the floor to Rosemary Carlo. Thank you. Madam President, the United Nations is closely following the ongoing diplomatic discussions on the future of European peace and security architecture among representatives of the Russian Federation, the United States, members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the European Union, and the Organization for the Security and Cooperation in Europe. We hope the outcome of these talks will strengthen peace and security in Europe, including for Ukraine. Madam President, although not an active participant in these exchanges, in all his contacts, the Secretary General has unequivocally supported the ongoing diplomatic efforts at all levels. Still, we remain greatly concerned that, even as these efforts continue, tensions keep escalating and a dangerous military buildup is in the heart of Europe. It is reported that over 100,000 troops and heavy weaponry from the Russian Federation are positioned along the border with Ukraine. Unspecified numbers of Russian troops and weaponry are also reportedly being deployed to Belarus ahead of large-scale joint military exercises in February on the borders with Ukraine, Poland, and the Baltic states. NATO members are reportedly planning additional deployments in Eastern European member states, and NATO has advised that 8,500 troops are now on high alert. Accusations and recriminations among the various actors involved in the ongoing discussions have created uncertainty and apprehension for many that a military confrontation is impending. Madam President, the Secretary General has made clear that there can be no alternative to diplomacy and dialogue 
to deal with the complex, long-standing security concerns and threat perceptions that have been raised. He has expressed his strong belief that there should not be any military intervention in this context and that diplomacy should prevail. He's been equally explicit that any such intervention by one country in another would be against international law and the United Nations Charter. His expectation is that we all contribute to avoiding confrontation and to creating conditions for a diplomatic solution to end this crisis. We therefore welcome the steps taken so far by all involved to maintain dialogue. We urge and expect all actors to build on these efforts and to remain focused on pursuing diplomatic solutions by engaging in good faith. We further urge all actors to refrain from provocative rhetoric and actions to maximize the chance for diplomacy to succeed. Achieving mutual understanding and lasting mutually acceptable arrangements is the best way to safeguard regional and international peace and security in the interest of all. Madam President, let me repeat the full commitment of the United Nations to the sovereignty, political independence, unity, and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders in accordance with relevant General Assembly resolutions. It is important, especially at this time, for the international community to intensify its support for the efforts of the Normandy Four and of the OSCE-led trilateral contact group to ensure the implementation of the Minsk agreements endorsed by this council in its resolution 2202. We welcome the recent meeting of the Normandy Four advisors in Paris and their agreement to reconvene shortly in Berlin as another sign that diplomacy can work. We commend these efforts and those of the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission. Likewise, United Nations agencies in Ukraine are committed to continue delivering on their mandates in accordance with the humanitarian principles of neutrality, impartiality, humanity, and independence. Safe, unimpeded humanitarian access must be respected under any circumstances to provide support to the 2.9 million people in need of assistance with the majority and non-government controlled areas. In this regard, I encourage member states to contribute to the humanitarian response plan. Further, the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine continues to document civilian casualties in the conflict area. Madam President, no one is watching the current diplomatic efforts more than the people of Ukraine. They have endured a conflict that has taken over 14,000 lives since 2014, and that tragically is still far from resolution. It is painfully obvious that any new escalation in or around Ukraine would mean more needless killing and destruction. Whatever one's position regarding the current situation or the status, of the status quo in eastern Ukraine, this should be inconceivable. The fact that it is not should give us pause. The principles enshrined in the UN Charter, the Helsinki Final Act, and multiple other commitments to safeguard regional and international peace and security are crystal clear. Any escalation or new conflict would deal another serious blow to the architecture so painstakingly built up over the last 75 years to maintain international peace and security just when we need it most. Once again, I'd like to stress the Secretary General's appeal to all concerned to take immediate steps to de-escalate tensions and continue on the diplomatic path. The United Nations stands ready to support all, to support all efforts to that end. Thank you, Madam President. I thank Rosemary DiCarlo for her briefing. I now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Under Secretary General DiCarlo, for your briefing. Colleagues, 
The situation we're facing in Europe is urgent and dangerous. And the stakes for Ukraine and for every UN member state could not be higher. Russia's actions strike at the very heart of the UN Charter. This is as clear and consequential a threat to peace and security as anyone can imagine. In the wake of World War II, the Council was formed to address precisely the kind of threat that Ukraine now faces. As Article 39 says, the Security Council shall determine the existence of any threat to the peace. Thus, our charge is not only to address conflicts after they occur, but also to prevent them from happening in the first place. This is why today's meeting is so crucial. Russia's aggression today not only threatens Ukraine, it also threatens Europe. It threatens the international order this body is charged with upholding. An order that, if it stands for anything, stands for the principle that one country cannot simply redraw another country's borders by force or make another country's people live under a government they did not choose. We continue to hope Russia chooses the path of diplomacy over the path of conflict in Ukraine. But we cannot just wait and see. It is crucial that this council address the risk that their aggressive and destabilizing behavior poses across the globe. First, let's be clear about the facts. Russia has assembled a massive military force of more than 100,000 troops along, the Ukraine's, along Ukraine's border. These are combat forces and special forces prepared to conduct offensive actions into Ukraine. This is the largest, this is the largest, hear me clearly, mobilization of troops in Europe in decades. And as we speak, Russia is sending even more forces and arms to join them. Russia has already used more than 2,000 rail cars to move troops and weaponry from across Russia to the Ukrainian border. Russia has also moved nearly 5,000 troops into Belarus with short-range ballistic missiles, special forces, and anti-aircraft batteries. We've seen evidence that Russia intends to expand that presence to more than 30,000 troops near the Belarus-Ukraine border, less than two hours north of Kyiv by early February. In addition to military activity, we've also seen a dramatic spike in cyber attacks on Ukraine in recent weeks. Russian military and intelligence services are spreading disinformation through state-owned media and proxy sites, and they are attempting without any factual basis to paint Ukraine and Western countries as the aggressors to fabricate a pretext for attack. Russia's military buildup on the border has been paired with extensive new demands and aggressive rhetoric. This is an escalation and a pattern of aggression that we've seen from Russia again and again. In 2014, Russia illegally invaded and seized Crimea. In 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. Russian troops are currently refusing to depart Moldova despite the wishes of the Moldovan people and their democratically elected government. And in the Donbas region of Ukraine, Russian-backed separatists continue to foment and ignore violence toward the Ukrainian people. Recently, Russia has threatened to take military action should its demands not be met. If Russia further invades Ukraine, none of us will be able to say we didn't see it coming. And the consequences will be horrific, which is why this meeting is so important today. Already Russians, Russia's war in Eastern Ukraine has killed more than 14,000 Ukrainians, nearly 3 million Ukrainians, half of whom are elderly people and children, need food, shelter, and life-saving assistance. Devastating as this situation is, it would pale in comparison to the humanitarian impact of the full-scale land invasion Russia is currently planning 
in Ukraine. Over the years, Russian leaders have claimed that Ukraine is not a real country and questioned its right to self-determination. So let's be clear. Ukraine is a UN member state that recently celebrated three decades of independence. It has a proud people and a rich culture. Ukraine is a sovereign country and a sovereign people entitled to determine their own future without the threat of force. This is not just the conviction that Ukrainians hold. It is a right enshrined by the UN Charter, a right that Russia and every other member of this institution has freely committed to upholding. Our international order is not perfect, but it is grounded in respect for people and countries to govern themselves, to defend themselves, and to associate with whom they choose. All countries have a stake in defending and preserving these principles, and nothing could be more fundamental. What would it mean for the world if former empires had license to start reclaiming territory by force? This would set us down a dangerous path. Russia could, of course, choose a different path, the path of diplomacy. In recent weeks, the United States, along with our European allies and partners and other nations around the globe, concerned by Russia's threat to Ukraine, have continued to do everything we can to resolve this crisis peacefully. In all of these talks, our messages have been clear and consistent. We seek the path of peace. We seek the path of dialogue. We do not want confrontation, but we will be decisive, swift, and united should R Russia further invade Ukraine. We continue to believe there is a diplomatic path out of the crisis caused by Russia's unprovoked military buildup. We're working to pursue diplomacy in every possible venue, but we also know that diplomacy will not succeed in an atmosphere of threat and military escalation. That is why we have brought this situation before the Security Council today. The United States has been clear. If this is truly about Russia's security concerns in Europe, we are offering them an opportunity to address these concerns at the negotiating table. The test of Russia's good faith in the coming days and weeks is whether they will come to that table and stay at that table until we reach an understanding. If they refuse to do so, the world will know why and who is responsible. Fellow members of the Council and other UN member states, we urge you to assess not only Russia's statements, but their actions with clear eyes to evaluate the risk this press this presents not just to Ukraine's border and its people, but to all of us. And to speak clearly and forcefully in favor of the path of diplomacy rather than the path of conflict. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United States and I give the floor to the representative of Albania. Thank you, Madam President, for convening this open meeting, and thank you, Under Secretary General Di Carlo, for your briefing. Madam President, the primary responsibility of the Security Council is to maintain peace and security with a view to preventing conflicts in the world. We have argued sev here several times that in terms of prevention, the Council has still a long way to go. The Council has been seized many times to discuss the situation in Ukraine since the beginning of the aggression in 2014, and here we are again today. We express our deep concerns on the military buildup of Russia near Ukraine in recent months. Dozens of battalions have been already dislocated to the Ukrainian border. Military troops are being dispatched from eastern to western part of Russia. This includes heavy combat forces, tanks, artillery, air defense systems, and ballistic missiles. Several thousands of Russian troops have also been sent to Belarus. 
This movement of troops and weaponry, weaponry is very worrying, has caused anxiety and fear among people in Ukraine and justifiably serious international concerns, particularly for us in Europe. Madam President, let me reconfirm our unwavering support for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Dear colleagues, in 1994, 27 years ago, Ukraine received security assurances through the Budapest Memorandum, where Russia, together with the US and UK, pledged, and I quote, to respect the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine in exchange for giving up its nuclear arsenal. The signatories also reaffirmed their commitment to seek UN Security Act Council action to provide assistance to Ukraine should it become a victim of an act of aggression. We call on Russia and the Security Council to expressly confirm the respect of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Madam President, it would be wrong to consider the threat of a military attack by Russia against Ukraine as another crisis between Russia and the West. This is a challenge to the European security order and to the whole international security architecture, which is based on the UN Charter. It is an affront to the 1975 Helsinki Final Act and its Decalogue, upon which OSCE is founded and where Russia is a part. These lost developments on the Russian-Ukrainian border are a well-known playbook. We have seen them in Georgia in 2008 and in Ukraine repeatedly since 2014, unfortunately at the cost of thousands of lives, civilian and military. Russia has used military violence as a means of achieving its political and geopolitical goals. Madam President, Russia is a big country and has a role to play in European and world geopolitics. It can play an important part in making the world a better and a safer place. Unfortunately, it is doing the contrary. The narratives of spheres of influence in Europe or dictating by threats the geostrategic orientation of other countries are tools of another century, of another time, reminiscences of the Cold War. Countries are and should be free to join whichever organization they want, be it NATO, the European Union, CSTO or CIS. Sovereign countries take decisions by their free will, not under the threat of a gun. Madam President, what is to gain in a potential conflict to which everyone anticipates the disastrous consequences? What can justify the loss of thousands of lives widespread destruction, severance of relations, continued tensions, including, as it has been made repeatedly clear, severe consequences for Russia itself. No other place knows more about war and its disastrous consequences than this room. Therefore, we must be able to see beyond and seek other means to address issues, however complex they are or seem to be. Albena believes that this crisis should be solved through talks and discussion. Finding solutions through negotiations was our primary focus during the OEC chairmanship in office in 2020. It remains the same now in the Council. There are several mechanisms to be used through diplomatic efforts. Concrete steps towards de-escalation are needed, paving the ground towards talks in efforts to seek solutions. Such efforts should be made in good faith and not be conducted in a climate of escalation rhetoric. The resumption of the Normandy format meetings last week in Paris was the right step, and we hope that this process will continue. Madam President, we all should bear in mind that the crisis in and around Ukraine has a direct impact on the whole Europe. The instrumentalization of ethnic minorities, targeted cyber attacks, political interference here and there for political gains, and a growing tendency of genocide denial and glorification on war crimes and war criminals, all these acts that are all these are acts that seek destabilization, create tension, and should be treated as a threat to peace and security because they are. This is why we deem of, of paramount importance to invest in prevention, and I hope this meeting will be part of such genuine efforts. And I thank you. 
I thank the representative of Albania and I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Madam President. And I'm grateful to Under Secretary General Di Carlo for her briefing. Madam President, the first article of the UN Charter defines our purpose here, to take collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to, to the peace. Today, over 100,000 Russian troops are massed on Ukraine's borders. They are equipped with tanks, armored vehicles, rocket artillery, and short-range ballistic missiles. They are supported by Russian air and maritime long-range strike capabilities. This is not a routine de deployment. This is the largest military buildup in Europe in decades. In the best case scenario, the scale of the Russian forces assembled on three sides of Ukraine is deeply destabilizing. In the worst case, it is preparation for a military invasion of a sovereign country. Madam President, in 2008, Russia told this council that it was sending peacekeepers into Georgia. In reality, it was invading an independent democratic country. In 2014, Russia denied to this council the presence of its forces in Crimea. In reality, its soldiers were annexing part of an independent democratic Ukraine. Today, Russia denies that its forces are posing a threat to Ukraine. But yet again, we see disinformation, cyber attacks, and destabilizing plots directed against an independent democratic country. Madam President, the United Kingdom welcomes our discussion today as part of the intense diplomatic efforts to ensure Russia de-escalates de the situation and avoids conflict. We are unwavering in our support for Ukraine's sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity. At the same time, we have sought dialogue with Russia through the OSCE, the NATO-Russia Council and bilateral discussions with all levels of the Russian government. We are ready to address mutual security concerns based on existing European security structures and international commitments. This includes our expectation that Russia should address our concerns. We are committed to a constructive dialogue if Russia is genuine about finding a diplomatic solution. This council has a vital interest in this diplomatic effort. Because let's be clear, this is not a regional issue. Any Russian invasion or act of aggression against Ukraine would be a gross breach of international law and Russia's commitments under the Charter. Conflict would re result in terrible bloodshed and destabilize the entire international community. There should be no doubt about how costly such a miscalculation would be for Russia or how devastating it would be for the people of Ukraine whose only provocation is to want a democratic future for their country. There would be no winners, only victims. Civilians caught in the crossfire or forced to flee. Families grieving the loss of fallen, fallen soldiers on both sides. So Madam President, we urge Russia to make clear in this council that it will abide by its obligations under the Charter, that it has no plans to invade Ukraine that it will refrain from the threat or use of force against its neighbor, that it will not further undermine Ukraine's sovereignty or territorial integrity by military or any other means, and that it will stand down its troops. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom. I give the floor to the representative of France. Madam, la pre Madam President, the situation at Ukraine's borders is a source of deep concern for France. The build-up of considerable military capacities along the border of a neighboring sovereign state represents threatening conduct. It raises legitimate questions on Russia's intentions, particularly 
since this country has already infringed the territorial integrity of Ukraine in the past. France reaffirms its full support for the independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. France calls on Russia to engage in de-escalating the situation, to abide by international law and to participate constructively in dialogue within the framework of established international mechanisms. The priority is to work together towards a swift de-escalation. President Macron has made efforts in that regard over the last few days during his trip to Berlin and then during his telephone call with President Putin. This Security Council meeting should also be in line with this objective. France supports all efforts at dialogue within the different existing frameworks and we hope that Europeans will be fully involved. In the context of the Normandy format that brings together Germany, France, Russia and Ukraine, these efforts enabled at the 26th of January meeting in Paris an agreement on a statement of support for the unconditional compliance with the ceasefire and the implementation of the Minsk agreements. We will pursue efforts in this direction at the next meeting planned to be held in short order in Berlin. Dialogue, regardless of the venue in which it takes place, must observe the fundamental principles underpinning European security as established in the Charter of the United Nations, in the founding documents of the OSCE, including the Helsinki Final Act and the Charter of Paris. These principles comprise, in particular, the sovereign equality and the territorial integrity of states, the inviolability of borders, the non-recourse to the threat or the use of force, and the freedom of states to either choose or change their own security measures. They are neither negotiable nor subject to any revision nor reinterpretation. Notions of spheres of influence have no place in the 21st century. If Russia does not choose the path of dialogue and respect for international law, the response will be robust and united. Any fresh infringement of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine by Russia will have massive consequences and a severe cost. Europeans are working on coordinated restrictive measures and stand ready together with their partners to react. If the path of dialogue and cooperation is chosen, the European Union stands ready to engage to develop its relations with Russia on the basis of a united, long-term and strategic approach in accordance with the five guiding principles from 2016. In the context of current threats and tensions, France reaffirms its solidarity with the Ukrainian people and government. With our European partners, we will continue to mobilize in support of Ukraine, particularly through support for reforms. Thank you. I thank the representative of France and I give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Madam President. We have been closely following the evolving developments relating to Ukraine, including through ongoing high-level security talks between the Russian Federation and the United States, as well as under the Normandy format in Paris. India's interest is in finding a solution that can provide for immediate de-escalation of tensions taking into account the legitimate security interests of all countries and aimed towards securing long-term peace and stability in the region and beyond. We have also been in touch with all concerned parties. It is our considered view that the issues can only be resolved through diplomatic dialogue. In this context, we welcome the efforts underway, including under the Minsk Agreement and the Normandy format. 
flowing from the recently concluded meeting in Paris under the Normandy format. We also welcome the unconditional observance of the July 2020 ceasefire and reaffirmation of Minsk agreements as the basis of work under the ongoing Normandy format, in particular, commitment of all sides to reduce disagreements on the way forward. We also welcome their agreement to meet in Berlin in two weeks. We urge all parties to continue to engage through all diplomatic channels and to keep working towards the full implementation of the Minsk package. Quiet and constructive diplomacy is the need of the hour. Any steps that increase tension may best be avoided by all sides in the larger interest of securing international peace and security. More than 20,000 Indian students and nationals live and study in different parts of Ukraine, including in its border areas. The well-being of Indian national is of priority to us. Madam President, I reiterate our call for the peaceful resolution of the situation by sincere and sustained diplomatic efforts to ensure that concerns of all sides are resolved through constructive dialogue. I thank you, Madam President. Thank the representative of India, and I give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Thank you very much, Madam President. A few moments ago, this council voted to adopt the agenda for this meeting to consider the situation in Ukraine. Our responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security makes it imperative to encourage the path of dialogue and preventive diplomacy. That is the only way to end the tensions, bridge the differences between the parties, and forge a unified and pacific position on the situation in Ukraine. Let me begin by thanking Rosemary DiCarlo, USG for Political Affairs and Peace Building, for the briefing. I also welcome the participation of the representatives of Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, and Lithuania in this meeting. Ghana has been following closely the situation in Ukraine. I've also listened carefully to the briefing we just received from the Secretariat, as well as the statement of delegations that have spoken before me. We have paid careful attention to the perspectives of the key parties to the situation and hope that at the end of this meeting, the views of members of this council will be closer to each other than when we first began. We note from the situation in Ukraine that while there has been a buildup of Russian troops at the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine, those troops are presently within the national territory of the Russian Federation. We also have taken note that while the military buildup of the troops of the Russian Federation are within its borders, this has caused for Ukraine and other parties a concern over the intentions of the buildup and its prospective implications on international peace and security. We therefore welcome the ongoing dialogue between the Russian Federation and the United States to address primary and secondary security concerns that have implications on the situation in Ukraine, as well as the recent face-to-face -face dialogue between the representatives of the Russian Federation and Ukraine under the Normandy format in Paris. After several months of no contact, to enhance trust and remove possibilities of an accidental incident. We note with concern the implications the situation has had on the economy of Ukraine and neighboring markets, and welcome in this regard the call by the President of Ukraine for an easing of the strong narratives on the situation. This must be a time for confidence building to facilitate a restoration of normalcy uh, for the people of Ukraine. In concluding, Madam President, Ghana believes that in conformity with the provisions of the charter of this organization, differences between member states should only be resolved through peaceful means. We remain encouraged by the ongoing diplomatic engagement between the parties and reiterate our support for those efforts which should also take into account the delicate nature of the situation. I thank you very much for your kind attention. I thank the representative of Ghana. I give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you very much, Madam President, and thanks also to Under Secretary General De Carlo for your briefing. Madam President, today's discussion is an important opportunity for the Council to address the developing situation at Ukraine's borders, which has become a matter of profound international concern. Let me underline at the outset that Ireland, along with our EU partners, is a strong and unwavering supporter of Ukraine's independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognised borders. At this moment of rising tension on Ukraine's frontiers, arising from Russia's military build-up, 
Ireland calls for calm, de-escalation and the pursuit of diplomacy. We call also for constructive and determined engagement on all dialogue tracks, including the Normandy format and the OSCE. Ireland is fully committed to the core principles enshrined in the UN Charter. These include the sovereign, the quality and territorial integrity of states. We recall today that these principles were agreed collectively and freely by all members of the United Nations. Moreover, European security is built on a series of essential commitments and obligations. It is the fundamental right of a sovereign and independent state to chart its own path in the world, to choose its own foreign policy, and to make arrangements for the security and defence of its territory. The Helsinki Final Act, one of the foundational documents of the OSCE, confirms the obligation of states, and I quote, to respect each other's sovereign equality and the right of every state to juridical equality, to territorial integrity, and to freedom and political independence, end of quote. Subsequent agreements, including the Charter of Paris and the Charter of European Security, agreed in Istanbul in 1999, reaffirm the core principles and underpinning collective European security. Madam President, earlier this month, Ireland marked 100 years of a hard-won independence. Just as we would not accept another state determining our foreign and security policy, Ukraine similarly has the sovereign right to choose its own policies. In this Council, we are too often faced with the terrible humanitarian consequences of violent conflict, usually where diplomacy and dialogue have failed. Force is never the answer. It is not the answer now. What is needed now, above all, is a negotiated diplomatic solution that reinforces our collective security in Europe. We have the institutions and the mechanisms within which to pursue this solution. Let us use them. Absent that, it will be innocent civilians who once again pay the awful price of conflict. Madam President, that is not a prospect any of us wish to contemplate. Thank you. I thank the representative of Ireland and I give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, China opposes the Security Council's holding of this open meeting as requested by the United States. The permanent representative of the U.S. to the U.N. in her letter to the President of the Council dated January 27th claimed that the reason why the U.S. is asking the Council to hold this open meeting was that Russia's deployment of troops along the Ukrainian border posed a threat to international peace and security. China cannot align itself with this point of view. Recently, there have indeed been some tensions over the issue of Ukraine, and we are paying attention to what exactly are causing the tensions. Some countries led by the United States have claimed that there will soon be a war in Ukraine. Russia has repeatedly stated that it has no plans to launch any military action. And Ukraine has made it clear that it does not need a war. Under such circumstances, what is the basis for the country's concern to insist that there may be a war? We note that the United States Ukraine and the relevant European countries, as well as NATO, are having varying forms of diplomatic contacts with Russia. The parties concerned should persist in seeking to resolve their differences through dialogues and negotiations. What we urgently need now is quiet diplomacy, but not microphone diplomacy. This is the viewpoint held by many members of the Council who have also made unrelenting efforts towards this end. Regrettably, the U.S. did not accept such a constructive proposal. 
at a time when dialogues and negotiations are underway, and concrete progress is yet to be made, the holding of such an open meeting by the Council is clearly not conducive to creating a favorable environment for dialogues and negotiations, nor is it conducive to diffusing the tension. China once again calls on all parties concerned to remain calm, not to do anything to aggravate tension or hype up the crisis, but to uh, properly resolve their differences through consultations on an equal footing on the basis of fully taking into account each other's legitimate security concerns and on the basis of mutual respect. Madam President, China's position on Ukraine is consistent. To solve this issue, we still need to return to the origin of implementing the new Minsk agreement. This agreement, endorsed by the Security Council in its Resolution 2202, is a binding foundational political document recognized by all parties and should really be effectively implemented. China supports all efforts in line with this direction and spirit of this agreement and hopes that all parties concerned will show their positive willingness to implement this new Minsk agreement, resolve their differences arising from the implementation of the agreement through consultation, and promote the actual implementation of this new Minsk agreement. The expansion of NATO is a problem difficult to circumvent in handling the current tension. NATO is the product of the Cold War, and NATO expansion epitomizes group politics. We believe that the security of one country cannot be achieved at the expense of the security of other countries, still less can regional security be guaranteed by intensifying or even expanding military groups. Today in the 21st century, all parties should completely abandon the Cold War mentality and come up with a balanced, effective, and sustainable European security mechanism through negotiations. And Russia's legitimate security concerns should be heeded and addressed. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of China, and I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Thank you, Madam President. We would like to thank Ms. Di Carlo for her briefing. And first and foremost, I would like to thank those countries who conducted themselves and deemed it possible to vote against or abstain against the proposal of the U.S. to discuss this topic today. One might have the impression that Russia is scared of discussing the situation regarding Ukraine and therefore uh, put forward this procedural vote. Russia is not refusing to discuss the situation in Ukraine, but we just don't understand what we are discussing here today and why we are indeed here today. As I already said, on the 17th of February, we are planning to hold a meeting during our presidency of the seventh anniversary of the implementation of the Minsk agreements, where we are able to talk about the situation with, uh, regarding Ukrainian settlement. But today's meeting is not about that at all. Recently, we've been encountering a very unusual, even given today's difficult time situation, a very unusual situation. The deployment of Russian troops within our own territory has frequently occurred on varying scales before and has not caused any hysterics whatsoever. Uh, troops and servicemen who are in their own uh, areas of deployment and barracks where they were before, and they are uh, where they were before, are not actually on the border. So this deployment of Russian troops in our own territory is getting our Western and uh, US colleagues uh, to say that there's going to be a planned military action and even an act of aggression 
but the USPR said as if that act of aggression has already taken place. I very carefully listened to her statement. The uh, military action of Russia against Ukraine that they're all assuring us is going to take place in just a few weeks' time, if not a few days' time. There, however, is no proof confirming such a serious accusation whatsoever being put forward. However, it is not preventing people from whipping up hysteria to such an extent that an actual economic impact is already being felt by our Ukrainian neighbors. Our uh, Western colleagues are talking about the need for de-escalation. However, first and foremost, they themselves are whipping up tensions and rhetoric and are provoking escalation. The discussions about a of threat of war is provocative in and of itself. You are almost calling for this. You want it to happen. You're waiting for it to happen as if you want to make your words become a reality. This is despite the fact that we are constantly rejecting these allegations. And this is despite the fact that no threat of a planned invasion into Ukraine from the lips of any Russian politician or public figure over all of this period has been made. No such threat has been made. Rather, at all levels, we've been categorically rejecting such plans. And I, we're going to do this right now. Everybody who claims the opposite is misleading you. If our Western colleagues who provoked and supported the 2014 bloody anti-constitutional coup bringing to power in Kiev nationalists, radicals, Russophobes, and pure fascists, uh, Nazis rather, uh, if they'd not done this, then we to date would be living in a spirit of good neighbourly relations and mutual uh, cooperation. However, some in the West just don't clearly like this positive scenario. Uh, what's happening today is yet another attempt to drive a wedge between Russia and Ukraine. Thanks to their geopolitical um, uh, games, our colleagues have been suffering for some seven years now. The Ukrainians are actively being brainwashed. They're cultivated with Russophobian and radical thinking, leading to the belief that for Ukraine to have a bright future, it mustn't establish relations with its neighbors, but rather at any cost, strive to join the EU and NATO. They are banning Russian, which is a native language for a significant, if not the majority, of people in Ukraine. They are causing an orthodox uh, split, church split, or divide. They are making heroes out of those people who fought on the side of Hitler, who destroyed Jews, Poles, Ukrainians, and Russians. The interests of the Ukrainian people in this destructive game is something that our Western colleagues are not taking into consideration. Their aim is to prevent the natural brotherly coexistence of our two people, uh, uh, brotherly peoples, uh, peoples and countries rather which would destroy their plans to weaken Russia to, and would uh, create an arc of instability around it. There's nothing that we're seeing that's new here that in the same spirit of divide and conquer. Uh, the divide and rule, uh, this same spirit was characteristic for um, Western powers or Western states rather earlier. It's also noteworthy that our American, colleague, American colleagues artificially are uh, getting involved in the sham tension that they themselves created on the Russian-Ukrainian border. There was the uh, negotiation process uh, put forward by ourselves to ensure uh, for Russia legally binding security guarantees. They deliberately are creating the impression that Moscow apparently is specifically or on purpose stirring up tension that um, means that it can be more accessible for the US and NATO. If you look at the timetable for the negotiation process, you'll see that such considerations are fundamentally untrue. 
The situation, in fact, is completely the opposite. Our Western colleagues are trying on the wave of, uh, on the, uh, the top of this wave of hysteria to boil our dialogue slowly down to so-called settlement of the situation on the border with Ukraine. Our security demands are much broader the non-accession uh, of Ukraine to NATO, the non-deployment in its territory of foreign troops. All of this is just one part of the agreement that could fundamentally improve the military political situation in Europe and for the world as a whole. And this type of agreement is something that we talked about in the Astana Istanbul and OSCE summits where apart from the freedom to choose one's allies or alliances was also the stipulation that the security guarantees of uh, some states should not be carried out to the detriment of the security of other states. Since our American uh, colleagues convened us today, let them show us any evidence apart from bogus narratives that Russia is intending to attack Ukraine. In the statement of my American colleague, there was a significant hodgepodge of accusations of aggressive actions by Russia, but no specific fact given. Incidentally, I'd like to put a question not only to our U.S. colleague, but also to those who said, where did you get the figure of 100,000 troops that are deployed, as you state, on the Russian-Ukrainian border, although that is not the case? We have never cited that figure. We've never confirmed that figure. We do recall this, and we recall this since a state, a Secretary of State Colin Powell in this very room uh, waved around a vial with an unidentified substance as so-called evidence of the presence of WMDs in Iraq. They didn't find any weapons, but what happened with that country is well known to one and all. Ukraine, as well, is a country, it seems, that our colleagues are prepared to sacrifice for their own pernicious interests. Otherwise, it's hard to explain why, in convening us today, the initiators of this meeting did not even heed the opinion of the president of Ukraine, who asked the West not to whip up panic, which has already had a harmful impact on the economic situation in the country. Otherwise, it's difficult to explain why our colleagues from the US and a number of other countries are actively pumping Ukraine full of weapons and ammunition and talk about this with great pride, moreover, the weapons that it would readily use against civilians in the east of its own country. And all this is being done in violation of the Minsk agreements approved by the UN Security Council as the only basis for a peaceful settlement of the internal Ukrainian conflict. Incidentally, to my American colleagues, well, she mentioned the fact that uh, 14,000 people have died in the conflict. I would recommend that she reads the report of the Special Monitoring Mission of the OSCE and look at what side, uh, how many people died on each side out of these 14,000. Most of these people are civilians in Donbass who died from shelling from the Ukrainian uh, armed forces. Madam President, the maneuvers of the U.S. regarding the convening of this meeting is particularly hypocritical because it was the Americans who hold the record for having troop presences outside their territory. American troops, advisors, and weapons, including nuclear weapons, are frequently deployed thousands of kilometers from Washington. I'm not even talking about the fact that the military adventures of the U.S. have killed hundreds of thousands of civilians of countries of uh, places where they were supposed to be bringing peace and democracy, the US consistently, including over recent years, has used force against other states without the authorization of the UN Security Council. In their arsenal, unilateral sanctions and coercive measures, uh, threats of implementing it, it seems to be like the ruling of some kind of uh, Supreme Court that they want to impose this upon enemy. For example, um, in many countries of the UN have been subject to um, aggression or attacks by the U.S. and 
191 countries of the Security Council have seen American troops deployed there. There is data available on the internet stating that uh, there are 750 U.S. bases in more than 80 countries of the world. The overall number are deployed abroad of U.S. troops. This is 175,000 troops are deployed abroad. 175,000. And more than 60,000 troops are deployed in Europe. The volume of the U.S. military budget was um, $700 billion, million, dollars, seven, seven, uh, eight, rather. Uh, so so uh, Russia's budget was 12 times lower. So these examples are spe pose a specific threat to international peace and security, and they're clear examples of this. As regards the uh, calls to settle the crisis regarding Ukraine. We wholeheartedly are clapping for this, but this crisis just has one dimension. It's a domestic Ukrainian crisis. And changing the situation, improving it, can only be done through Kiev implementing the already mentioned Minsk agreements that stipulate primarily direct dialogue with Donetsk and Lugansk. There is no other option if our Western partners push Kiev to sabotage the Minsk agreements, the, something that uh, Ukraine is, uh, 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 that they're willingly uh, wanting to, they're willingly using, they're willingly doing, then that might end in the absolute worst way for Ukraine and not because somebody has destroyed it, but because it would have destroyed itself. And Russia has absolutely nothing to do with this. Don't try to shift the blame onto somebody else. And we are going incidentally to talk about all of this in detail on the 17th of February during the long planned annual UN Security Council meeting on the implementation of Resolution 2202. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation. I give the floor to the representative of Gobo. Merci, Madame la... Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to thank um, the Under Secretary General Rosemary DiCarlo for her briefing. Madam President, my country is following closely the prevailing situation at the borders of Ukraine and Russia. We have taken note of the information on a considerable mobilization of Russian troops at Ukraine's borders that portend imminent military action. This alarming information is accompanied on the ground by a true maelstrom of activity along with the deployment of troops, uh, military hardware and military hardware from friendly countries of Ukraine. The consequential rhetor uh, rhetorical escalation and acute tensions are polarizing important diplomatic activity conducted through various initiatives, including the Normat Formandy, uh, the, the Normandy format uh, in the framework of the implementation of the Minsk agreements. In the face of this situation of particularly worrisome tensions, my country, aware of the challenges and the potential of the forces in place, calls on all stakeholders to demonstrate restraint and to favour the path of dialogue and negotiation in order to preserve peace and stability in the region. It is time for the international community and its members to activate the channels of preventive diplomacy such as those provided by Chapter 6 of the UN Charter enshrined in the Peaceful Settlement of Disputes. It is clear that the effectiveness of this preventive diplomacy depends not only on the good faith of the protagonists, but also on the tactful and calm conduct, as well as the framework within which such diplomacy occurs. We see a two-sided rhetoric. On the one hand, an alarming rhetoric on the imminence of military action in Ukraine, and on the other, a denial from the other side. These intensify the fragmentation of this Council, just as the people of the world are expecting from our Council a consensus and resolute action commensurate with the havoc wrought by wars and crises that are bringing bloodshed to several regions of the planet. 
The strength of this council resides in its unity. It is unity and not fragmentation that make this council worthy of its mandate working for peoples of the world. We believe that diplomacy in its most practical and efficient forms is capable of bringing calm to the borders of Ukraine. To conclude, I would like to echo here the appeal made last Friday by the Ukrainian president asking for parties to exercise restraint and to refrain from whipping up panic. Thank you very much, Madam President. I thank the representative of Gabor and I give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you very much, Madam President. And let me also thank USG Rosemary Di Carlo for the briefing he has put forward uh, to the Council this morning. Geopolitical tensions and threats to international peace and security require the Security Council to engage promptly and timely. Open references to military actions, unilateral economic sanctions and other measures are developments that should be avoided under the UN Charter. The Security Council must fulfill its primary objective, which is to prevent war. There is an, a general and urgent need to resort to meaningful dialogue with and between the parties directly involved in the escalation of tensions. We urge all parties to exercise maximum restraint and to engage constructively in talks aimed at resolving their differences. There is room to restore confidence and find a lasting diplomatic solution to this crisis. For that, we need political will and genuine commitment from all sides. Brazil encourages all parties to strictly observe international law. It is imperative to apply the principles enshrined in the char Charter consistently, in a non-selective manner. The prohibition of use of force, the peaceful resolution of disputes, and the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the protection of human rights are pillars of our collective security system. Brazil also highlights the need for good faith in order to address legitimate security concerns of all parties, including Russia's and Ukraine's. We encourage parties to pursue genuine talks on the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Security Council Resolution 2202, which provided useful guidelines to address the situation in East, Eastern Ukraine, is also a valuable tool in the diplomatic efforts to overcome the situation. Brazil welcomes the resumption of talks in the Normandy format and the renewed commitment to the ceasefire in eastern Ukraine. Despite the sensitive and difficult nature of the issue on our agenda today, I would like to conclude with a note of hope. It has been encouraging to hear over the past few days statements to the effect that there is no military solution to the situation. At this moment in particular, this should be the motto of the whole United Nations membership and of the Security Council for a renewed commitment to diplomacy and prevention. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Brazil and I give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Thank you, Madam President, uh, for giving me the floor and also for the able way in which you have presided over the Security Council in the month of January. I thank Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo for her briefing, and I welcome the participation of the representatives of Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, and Poland. Kenya abstained on the procedural vote to hold this meeting. We did so to reflect our contention that the main issue in question here is the impasse between NATO and the Russian Federation. We believe that it is imminently solvable and that the diplomatic steps underway 
already show promise. This, rather than escalation in search of a winner-take-all outcome, is what is required to support and protect international peace and security. <clears throat> Kenya has always maintained that the respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of all countries is a cornerstone of global peace. Where there are disputes regarding territorial jurisdiction or security interests, we strongly support patient diplomacy as the first, second, and third options. When the dispute is between major powers and regards the security of a third country, it is imperative that they embrace a spirit of compromise. We believe that the United States, NATO, and the Russian Federation have an opportunity to establish a diplomatic framework that will allow them to resolve their differences. Their security and that of the entire world depends on them willingly taking this step, not in ushering in a new age of containment, provocation, and proxy actions. Compromise is not surrender. The special powers given to the Security Council's permanent members demands that they embrace this principle if the United Nations is not to go the way of the doomed League of Nations. Africa recalls the rejections of compromise and the search for total victory that led to the Cold War. We experienced that Cold War as a series of hot wars and interventions that deeply damaged our dreams for peace, development, and competent, inclusive government. Our internal divisions and fragilities were weaponized at the altar of geopolitical rivalry. It confirmed the truth of the African saying that recognizes, when elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. Madam President, given that the majority of the conflict situations the Security Council deals with are in Africa, we do not want them to serve as surrogates for a new Cold War. We in Africa, therefore, have a direct stake in de-escalation and renewed faith in diplomacy. We have serious challenges to solve together. Rarely has the world more urgently needed a United Nations that can deliver ambitiously. Madam President, Kenya believes that there is still plenty of opportunity for the Normandy format talks, the trilateral contact group on Ukraine, and the direct negotiations between the United States and the Russian Federation to produce a satisfactory outcome. We urge all these parties to ensure that their negotiations respect the security, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Faith in innovative diplomacy may also allow for agreements between today's major powers inspired by the 1975 Helsinki Accords, which did deliver some stability to Europe during the Cold War. This time, however, such agreements need to advance the principle of non-interference to other parts of the world, and particularly to Africa. Madam President, in closing, it is critical that diplomacy and its acceptance of compromise as an inevitable outcome win the day. If there are future discussions to be held in the Security Council on this matter, let it be to announce a new era of cooperation. I thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya, and I give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Thank you very much, Madam President. And thank you to Under Secretary General Di Carlo for her briefing. I would like to welcome the representatives of Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, and Lithuania to this meeting. Madam President, I'd like to begin by noting that my country deems the holding of this meeting as timely, and that in accordance with our, principle, our foreign policy principles. In addition, we deem it relevant 
since the Security Council must be informed about the prevailing situation in Ukraine. It is not in our interest to contribute to further polarizing the narrative. Thus, I will limit myself to noting what, for Mexico, should be basic principles for the consideration of this matter in accordance with the United Nations Charter. In this case, I will refer to three of them. The prohibition on the threat or the use of force in international relations, the principle of non-intervention, and the peaceful settlement of disputes. On the first principle, the mere escalation of tensions in Eastern Europe represents a potential threat to international peace and security and thus it falls within the purview of this Council pursuant to Article 39 of the Charter. For this very reason, and in light of the prevailing mistrust, it's important to try to avoid any type of action that might be considered as hostile by any of the parties, however slight it may seem. But it is, however, encouraging to hear what we have just heard from the representative of the Russian Federation. He was very clear in reiterating here that there is no planned invasion in Ukraine. I think that I have cited word for word what he said. Well, how good it would be if that is the case. This is a unilateral statement of non-aggression. Mexico maintains, together with what has been said by the Secretary General and others here in this room, that there is no military solution in this issue. On the contrary, preventive diplomacy and dialogue should be followed as means to achieving an easing of tensions and there are to that end various channels. The conversations in Geneva, the trilateral contact group and the Normandy format. On non-intervention, we reiterate the importance of respecting the sovereignty, unity and territorial integrity of Ukraine in full adherence to international law, the United Nations Charter and Resolution 2625 of the General Assembly. Hence, it falls to this Security Council to determine as applicable the existence of an act of aggression in accordance with General Assembly Resolution 3314. Added to what I have just stated, this principle is further bolstered, bolstered by the principle of the peaceful settlement of disputes. States have the duty to settle their disputes by peaceful means, as established in international law. Mexico has upheld, upholds and will continue to uphold diplomacy above force and diplomatic paths for this particular case remain open. They have not been exhausted. Madam President, where there is no doubt is with regard to the responsibility of this Council to make its due preventive efforts to act as warranted by these circumstances. And I firmly believe that in holding this meeting, we are doing that. We are complying with our mandate without excess nor omission. Thank you very much, Madam President. I thank the representative of Mexico and I give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Shukran. Thank you, Madam President. At the outset, I would like to thank Rosemary Di Carlo, Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, for her informative briefing. Madam President, the UAE is closely monitoring recent developments. In the context of our discussion today, I would like to focus on the following aspects. First, 
the UAE firmly believes that the dispute in Europe requires various countries in the region to engage in a serious dialogue based on the values of stability, coexistence and peace. We stress the importance of reaching a negotiated solution to this issue through the available mechanisms and with the support of regional organizations. We refer here to the Normandy format talks and the initiative of the chair of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe that aims to initiate a substantive dialogue on European security. To address the security concerns of its members. We also welcome President Volodymyr Zelensky's appeal for calm. And we hope to build on it to further build confidence in the region. Second, the UAE welcomes the announcement made in the Normandy format meeting on the 26th of January, in which the Russian Federation and the Republic of Ukraine confirmed their intention to implement an unconditional ceasefire in eastern Ukraine. We are counting on the various initiatives currently underway to allow for dialogue, including between the United States and the Russian Federation, whose existing diplomatic efforts must be supported and given space to achieve the desired results. The UAE also stresses the importance of maintaining security and stability, as well as the central importance of the Minsk agreements and the need to adhere to them and ensure their implementation. This will contribute to reaching a comprehensive regional understanding that maintains the security and stability of the concerned countries and addresses all their legitimate concerns. Third, escalation must be avoided as it could have a negative impact on civilians and exacerbate the fragile humanitarian situation in eastern Ukraine. In this spirit, we stress the importance of considering the humanitarian needs of civilians and of preventing the deterioration of the humanitarian situation in the region. Fourth, respect for and adherence to international law is essential to ensure that the situation in Eastern Europe does not deteriorate further. We also stress the importance of these principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity and good neighborliness, which are indispensable for the maintenance of international peace and security. Finally, Madam President, the UAE reiterates the importance of constructive dialogue to resolve differences. The role of the Security Council as the body responsible for maintaining international peace and security is essential to provide a diplomatic platform that enables states to present and resolve their differences peacefully. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Arab Emirates. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as representative of Norway. Let me start by expressing Norway's strong support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. This includes the Crimea Peninsula and its territorial waters. Norway is deeply concerned about the Russian large-scale military buildup near the Ukraine's border and in occupied Crimea. This is unprovoked and unjustified. Further escalation can have devastating humanitarian consequences. Through its harsh statement and unrealistic demands, Russia now challenges the security architecture in all of Europe. The crisis therefore not only affects the region, but represents a clear threat to international peace and security. Russia has repeatedly accused NATO of increasing tensions. I would like to underline that the alliance is defensive and voluntary. We do not seek confrontation. At the same time, we cannot and will not compromise on the principles on which the security in Europe rests. We stand ready to discuss security concerns. Norway supports the European security order based on international law and national sovereignty. We cannot allow this to be replaced by spheres of influence. Every country has the right to freely choose its security alignment. We call on Russia to de-escalate and to engage constructively in dialogue through the established international mechanisms in good faith. Furthermore, Norway underlines its support for the existing international frameworks for the sustainable and peaceful resolution of conflicts in accordance with international law. Russia has itself repeatedly invoked in many other council discussions the principles of respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. Norway calls on Russia to now respect these principles when it comes to Ukraine. Thank you. 
I shall now give the floor to the representative of the United States who has asked for the floor to make a further statement. Good. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I can't say that I am uh, surprised by my Russian colleagues' comments, but I am disappointed. Uh, Madam President, um, I cannot let uh, the false equivalency uh, go unchecked, so I, uh, I, I feel I must respond. Let me be clear, there are no plans to weaken Russia as claimed by our Russian colleague today. On the contrary, we welcome Russia as a responsible member of the international community, but its actions on the border of Ukraine are not responsible. The threats of aggression on the border of Ukraine, yes, on its border, is provocative. Our recognition of the facts on the ground is not provocative. The threats of action if Russia's uh, security demands aren't met is provocative. Our encouraging diplomacy is not provocative. The provocations from Russia, not from us or other members of this council. We have made clear our commitment to the path of diplomacy. I hope our Russian colleagues will also choose this path and engage peacefully with the international community, including Ukraine. I say to Russia simply this, your actions will speak for themselves, and we hope and encourage that you make the right choices before this council today. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of the United States. I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation who has asked for the floor to make further uh, well, Thank you, Madam President. I didn't plan to enter a dialogue between Russia and the US in this meeting. Everything that we wanted to say is in our statement today. However, we really just don't understand what threats and provocations and escalation by Russia is being talked about. Okay, fine. You already said about this in your statement, talked about this. But I want to say that when I heard the statement of the US, I didn't hear any mention or any reference to the Minsk agreement or 2202, the Security Council resolution. And that is very indicative, incidentally. So this is the context that we need to use when we're talking about the Ukrainian crisis. The US is looking at this from a completely different angle. And ultimately, Madam President, I would like to apologize to the members of the council. And I don't want to uh, change the situation. I, I really, just before our presidency of uh, the uh, Security Council have to meet with the Secretary General, so I'm going to have to leave. And so I can't change uh, this situation because of the SG's timetable, so I'm going to have to leave. I do apologize. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation. I wish now then to again remind all speakers to limit their statement to no more than five minutes in order to enable the Council to carry out this work expeditiously. I now give the floor to the representative of Ukraine. Well, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I would like immediately to uh, apologize that I may not be uh, within the five-minute uh, limits, especially given the length of the Russian intervention. I would like to express my gratitude to the Norwegian presidency for calling this briefing of the Security Council, of the need of which I spoke exactly a fortnight ago with Her Excellency Foreign Minister of Norway during our meeting here in New York. I express our thanks to the US, who as a member of the Security Council, in close coordination with Ukraine, and partners requested today's briefing. And of course, I express our appreciation of the presentation by Under Secretary Di Carlo. It's a duty and need for the Security Council to be fully informed in case of grave threats to international peace and security. What is going on along the border with Ukraine, where the Russian Federation continues its military buildup, falls under the above qualification. 
It is important that Ukraine's vote is heard today in the Security Council and is not lost in translation when the position of my country has been delivered by a foreign ambassador in the Russian language. I would ask the deputy of Vasily Alexeyevich to tell him that my leadership speaks its language, has its own ambassadors and spokespersons. So there is no need to interpret the words of Ukrainian officials in a foreign language, especially if it is done the way Humpty Dumpty, Shaltai Baltai, spoke of the meaning of the words. Even if Lewis Carroll appears to be a favorite writer of the Russian top diplomats. Against the backdrop of unprecedented sequence of high-level diplomatic contacts in the past few weeks, a serious talk in the Security Council is required more than ever to present facts, to listen to each other's positions and concerns, as well as to outline further actions towards the escalation. The fact is that nowadays about 112,000 Russian troops have been amassed around Ukraine's borders and in Crimea. And together with the maritime and aviation components, their number reaches about 130,000. Another fact is that the Russian troops are also being deployed to Belarus for the Union Resolve 2022 joint drills to be held on 10 to 20th February. They include, in particular, Iskander missile divisions, S-400 Triumph and Panzer anti-aircraft uh, systems, Sukhoi 35 Generation 4 plus plus fighters. On top of that, on 26 January, the Russian fleet started another military drill in the Black Sea with involvement of frigates, patrol ships, missile ships, assault landing ships, and minesweepers. This reminds us of the ongoing heavy militarization of the temporarily occupied Crimea, the Black Sea, and the Sea of Azov by Russia, which poses a serious threat to Ukraine, all littoral states, and their wider region. Significant reinforcement of combat capabilities of the Russian occupation forces in Donbas is another worrying trend. Currently, these formations formations consist of up to 35,000 personnel, including around 3,000 servicemen of the Russian armed forces, on command posts and in other critical combat positions. In the border areas outside government control illegal border crossings by cargo trains and truck convoys delivering armed supplies to the Russian armed fo formations in Donbass is a routine practice. OEC SMM reports provide ample evidence of various illegal activities in the border areas. No surprise, the restrictions of the OEC SMM freedom of movement are on the increase, in particular in non-government controlled areas close to the Ukraine-Russia border. On the 22nd December 2021, the trilateral contact group reached another understanding on resuming the ceasefire regime. Nevertheless, shootings, shellings, sniper fire on Ukrainian positions and systematic use of attack UAVs against Ukrainian troops have not stopped. We have lost 12 servicemen killed in action and 14 wounded since 22nd December 2021. Just a few days ago, on January 25, armed formations of the Russian Federation once again attacked the positions of the armed forces of Ukraine in the area of Pishevik, Donetsk region, using an attack UAV. VOG-17 fragmentation grenades dropped from the UAV resulted in severe injuries to two Ukrainian servicemen. The current impasse in the consultations process within the framework of the TCG continues on practically all tracks. 
While the decisions adopted by the Normandy format leaders during their December 2019 summit in Paris remain unimplemented. Over the past year and a half, we have seen deliberate efforts by the Russian side to, out, to obstruct TCG activities and even to prevent finalization of the already agreed, including at the expert level, arrangements within TCG in the security and humanitarian areas. All this is, a is accompanied by Russia's stubborn denial of being a party to the armed conflict that has been raging for eight years now in the Donbas region of Ukraine, attempts to impose a so-called direct dialogue with these puppet occupation administrations, as well as refusal to engage in substantive discussion on political settlement of the conflict. The question is why all these Russian forces are there. We have asked this question on different fora, along with sending own clear messages. Ukraine is not going to launch military offensive, neither in Donbas, nor in Crimea, nor anywhere else. Ukraine sees no alternative to peaceful resolution of the ongoing conflict and restoration of its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Yet we also see a surge in Russian disinformation campaign, including false accusations of Ukraine plotting a military attack. This is not going to happen. This is direct evidence of Russia's unwillingness to de-escalate and prepare to justify its possible further aggression. We are well aware of Russia's history of ploys and provocations, and we will do everything possible to prevent another Manila-type provocation by Russia. Once again, I have clear instructions from my government to reiterate today the absence of any aggressive intention, as well as Ukraine's strong commitment to peace. Today we have heard from the Russian side that they do not intend to launch a war against my country. Although, one should rather speak about to launch a new phase of the Russian aggression. It is a very important message, as we still lack credible explanations by Russia of its actions and military movements. Based on experience, we cannot believe Russian declarations, but only practical moves on withdrawal of troops from the border. Madam President, Ukraine strongly rejects any attempt to use the threat of force as an instrument of pressure to make Ukraine and our partners accept illegitimate demands. There is no room for compromise on principal issues. The most principal position for Ukraine is that we have inherent sovereign right to choose our own security arrangements, including treaties of alliance, which cannot be questioned by Russia. Moreover, this right is enshrined in many international legal instruments that Russia itself a party to. Ukraine will not bow to threats aimed at weakening Ukraine, undermining its economic and financial stability, and inciting public frustration. This will not happen and the Kremlin must remember that Ukraine is ready to defend itself. At the same time, we support the need to keep diplomatic channels with Russia open, if that prevents a shift to military tools. My president has reiterated most recently that he is ready to meet his Russian counterpart. If Russia has any questions to Ukraine, it is better to meet and talk not to bring troops to the Ukrainian borders and intimidate Ukrainian people. For Ukraine, the first priority today is to achieve a sustainable and unconditional ceasefire in Donbas. The ceasefire regime must be guaranteed, reliable, and on this basis, further steps can be taken. Intensification of the work of the Normandy format, including at the level of leaders of the four countries is an important prerequisite for next steps towards lasting peace in Donbass. 
and we are ready to resume Normandy 4 talks in all formats. The recent political advisors meeting on 26 January in Paris, despite many differences, gives a hope for a continuation of the negotiation process, which Ukraine will staunchly support. Madam President, we consider that despite the Russian attempt to impede the briefing from being held, the Security Council and the wider UN membership have received today a very important information. Information that the members of the Security Council need to take an informed decision when appropriate to act swiftly and decisively in, empl in employing preventive diplomacy under the Chapter 6 of the UN Charter that rests on the Security Council responsibility to investigate any dispute or any situation which might lead to international friction or give rise to a dispute. After listening to the Russian ambassador today, I would like to ask how long Russia will pressure, will pursue a clear attempt to push Ukraine and its partners into a Kafka trap. And still, I perhaps should acknowledge that it was important to hear the Russian envoy today, and yet I must end with what my foreign minister has recently said, and I quote, if Russian officials are serious when they say they don't want a new war, Russia must continue diplomatic engagement and pull back military forces it amassed along Ukraine's borders, as in the temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine. Diplomacy is the only responsible way, end of quote. Let's judge by actions, not by riddles and semantic puzzles. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of Ukraine, and I give the floor to the representative of Belarus. Thank you, Madam President. The Republic of Belarus is continuing to uphold its consistent and principled position on the unacceptable nature of resolving any conflict by force. We have made significant efforts to settle the conflict in Ukraine. Our country is still prepared to do everything possible to restore dialogue and mutual understanding in the region. There is no alternative to the Minsk agreements playing a key role in the peaceful settlement of the crisis. The negotiation process as part of the trilateral contact group and also the practical implementation of the agreements in the conflict zone of the domestic Ukrainian conflict will enable the peace process in Ukraine to get on a sustainable, positive track. The U.S. delegation proposing today's topic for consideration in the Security Council is yet another attempt to artificially whip up tension in the region purely for as an instrument of political accusations. Such actions only heighten mistrust and in no way help to solve disagreements. Despite the concerns expressed by, frequently by representatives of the Republic of Belarus uh, at international fora, negotiation, negotiating for enduring bilateral contacts, the expansion of military powers on our western and southern borders not only is not ceasing, but rather it's becoming threatening in nature, despite our consistent calls for dialogue and cooperation, including regarding arms control. In fact, even more pressure is being exerted on our country by individual countries. Our proposals to return to negotiations are not being responded to by our Western partners. Incidentally, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that here we had a reference to the Budapest Memorandum. I do really urge you to read that document regarding the Republic of Belarus, and I would draw your attention to the promises in that document not to exert any coercive economic measures on Belarus and to remember the numerous packages of economic sanctions from individual states that have been imposed against us. Given the current difficult situation, the leaders of Belarus and Russia have taken the decision to conduct jointly 
activities to assess the preparedness of the armed forces of the two states to provide military security, given the commitments of our military political alliance. As part of these d agreements, a decision has been taken in February this year to conduct a verification of r the re reaction responsiveness of our forces of our alliance. The main aims of this verification of the military forces is to assess the preparedness and capability of our military command and control to conduct joint exercises to guarantee security of our allied state, to uh, develop joint measures to eradicate the threat on the borders of our allied state, including caused by the migration crisis and the need to stabilize the humanitarian situation, organizing the defense and protection of strategically important facilities to curb and ward off external acts of aggression during defensive operations and to combat terrorism and protect the interests of our um, state alliance. At the final stage of these uh, activities, uh, from the 10th to the 20th of February this year, there will be a joint Belarusian-Russian uh, exercises called Allied Resolve 2022. During these drills, there will be joint drills carried out for specific purposes. We note that these options for actions for this regional group of uh, troops uh, something that have been regularly uh, developed during joint exercises. They are always purely defensive in nature and they pose no threat either for our European partners or our neighbouring countries. The Republic of Belarus is continuing to uphold unswervingly all of its obligations under international regional treat treaties rather, on arms control. Incidentally, all information about the forthcoming military drills is fully available on the official site of the Republic of Belarus Defence Ministry. Just a few days ago, on the 28th of January, the President of the Republic of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, responding to questions stated that war is only possible in two circumstances, if there is an attack on Belarus or if there is an attack on our ally, the Russian Federation. Responding to the different insinuations against Belarus regarding any thing to do with the domestic Ukrainian situation, we'd like to remind you that Belarus is prepared to continue to provide all necessary assistance to settle the conflict in Ukraine. This includes through setting up all necessary conditions for the work of the trilateral group and for negotiations in any possible formats and options. Today, many people in the world are talking about the need to have broad dialogue on issues of international security an initiative on holding this kind of dialogue under the conditional name Helsinki 2. Such an initiative was put forward by the President of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, some years ago now, and this idea, unfortunately, has not yet been implemented. The Republic of Belarus sincerely wants a swift settlement of the regional crisis, purely on the basis of dialogue and mutual respect. Thank you. I thank the representative of Belarus and I give the floor to the representative of Poland. Madam President, Madam Under Secretary General, Excellencies, Poland is grateful for convening today's meeting on the Security Council as we are, we are increasingly concerned with the Russia's continuous large scale military build up on the border with Ukraine, both in the territory of Russia but also in the territory of Belarus, including continuous redeployments of troops repositioning of military hardware and offensive weapons. We cannot keep quiet because what is happening in our neighborhood constitutes a serious threat to international peace and security reaching far beyond our region and continent. The current security situation in Eastern Europe unfortunately follows a pattern of precedence with the Russian Federation being the destabilizing actor in the region at least since 2008 and the war in Georgia 2014 and illegal annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. As we speak, the frozen conflicts in eastern Ukraine, in the Georgian breakaway regions of Tsin Valley and Abkhazia, and in the Transnistrian region of the Republic of Moldova are un un unresolved, undermining the stability and regional security of this part of the world. 
Madam President, we cannot keep quiet because what is happening in our neighborhood constitu constitutes the outright violation of the fundamental principles enshrined in the UN Charter. Poland deeply adheres to the principles of international law, such as sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, the availability of frontiers, and then use or threat of force. And we, cannot, and we call upon all member states to act in the same spirit. We know very well from our country's history that the political order based on the spheres of influence brings no positive results. It is here in the United Nations when we, where uh, it's our duty to protect the principles of international law, strongly condemn any threat of use of force, and work together to dismantle spheres of influence in order to maintain peace. What is at stake today is not only the subordination of Ukraine and the creation of the so-called buffer zone in Eastern and Central Europe. The real threat is, threat is to shake the very foundation of the security architecture in Europe by undermining such tenets as of international laws and inviolability of borders and the freedom to choose one's own security arrangements, among others. Unfortunately, this may have a global impact and contribute to the deterioration of international security, not to mention the possible humanitarian crisis. And there are, no, uh, and, and there are other revisionist powers which may follow the suit. Madam President, Poland deeply believes in the power of preventive diplomacy. Holding the chairmanship in office of the Organization for Security and Cooperation Europe, we stand open to facilitate talks on the European security within the organization. OSCE can provide the right venue to discuss matters of concern because of being the broadest of the regional formats. We call for constructive engagement of all participating states in order to find a peaceful solution to the current crisis. Let there be no doubt that the current status quo is not a solution at all. Living in a constant fear of another frozen conflict is against the commitment of the, these United Nations to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as a good neighbors. With Winter Olympics uh, just uh, less than a week away, uh, let us whatever we can, uh, let us do whatever we can to maintain the Olympic peace in the Eastern Europe. And I thank you. I thank the representative of Poland and I give the floor to the representative of Lithuania. Madam President, let me thank you for convening this meeting on such important issue and for granting an opportunity to speak. I am delivering this statement on behalf of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and my own country, Lithuania. Firstly, let me reiterate our country's unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. We strongly condemn the clear violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity by acts of aggression by the Russian armed forces since February 2014. We do not recognize and continue to condemn the illegal annexation of Ukraine's autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol by Russia. We remain concerned over the increasing militarization of the peninsula, the severe deterioration of the human rights situation there. Let me add in this context that we welcome the establishment of the International Crimean Platform launched at the kickoff summit that took place on 23rd August in Kiev and support the implementation of its joint declaration. We invite other UN members to join this initiative as well. Madam President, the conflict in Ukraine has claimed around 14,000 lives, displaced 1.5 million persons, and has resulted in countless suffering on both sides of the contact line in Eastern Ukraine. We reiterate our full support to the efforts towards peaceful and sustainable resolution of this conflict, namely in the Normandy format, the Trilateral Contact Group, and the OAC, including its special monitoring mission to Ukraine. Yet, despite all international efforts, until now, we see little progress towards the resolution of this conflict. Ukraine's constructive approach has not been reciprocated by Russia. We condemn Russia's continued aggressive actions and threats against Ukraine and call on Russia to de-escalate the situation and to abide by international law. We call on Russia to immediately stop fueling the conflict by providing financial and military support to the armed formations it backs and to withdraw the Russian military troops and material from the eastern border of Ukraine and Crimean Peninsula. Madam President, despite all diplomatic efforts, 
Russia further escalates and continues military deployment around Ukraine's borders. Moreover, Russian troops are deployed in Belarus as well. This adds up to the current escalation and is of direct concern to us. Kremlin continues to use a false narrative that Russia is forced to defend itself from a threat, even as the opposite is true. It is Russia who is threatening Ukraine and other neighbors by positioning over 100,000 troops. Russia is not a victim as it attempts to portray itself. It is the aggressor, strengthening its security at the expense of others. By its own actions in the Georgian breakaway regions of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, the transition region, the illegal annexation of Crimea, Russia has contributed to a significant deterioration of security environment in Europe. We reaffirm, reaffirm full commitment to the core principles of international security enshrined in the UN Charter, founding documents of the OEC, including the Helsinki Final Act and the Charter of Paris and others. This includes, notably, the sovereign equality and territorial integrity of states, the inviolability of frontiers, refraining from the use of force. Their violation of, by Russia is an obstacle to a common and indivisible security space in Europe and threatens peace and stability on our continent. Times of limited sovereignty in Europe are long gone. Notions of spheres of influence have no place in the 21st century. States have freedom to choose or change their own security arrangements. No third country has a veto right over the sovereign choices of independent and democratic states. Madam President, in response to the recent tensions, the EU has made clear in the December and January European Council conclusions that any further military aggression against Ukraine will have massive consequences and severe costs, including restrictive measures to be coordinated closely with our transatlantic partners. Madam President, President, we call on Russia to respect principles of UN Charter, de-escalate, and engage in genuine dialogue. It is our duty as members of the UN to defend the rules-based international system. Violation of its fundamental principles, we have the consequences for other parts of the world. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Lithuania. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned. by day by day. These include both the most basic needs such as shelter, food and medical care, as well as those that will be provided long after the war is over, education, psychological and medical support. The world is not leaving Ukraine alone. States and inter international organizations provide institutional care and support while hundreds of thousands of people show solidarity and provide assistance. Yesterday, the United Nations organization appealed for humanitarian aid. The UN wants to allocate 1.7 billion worth of support. Uh, the aid is ex expected to reach more than 6 million people in urgent need of assistance. In Ukraine and in the neighboring countries, they are providing shelter. The solidarity of the entire international community in the face of this strategy constitutes a huge value. We call on the people of goodwill around the world, on civil society organizations, churches and state leaders, let us do all we can to end this war, an adult war which is claiming the lives of the youngest. A war is, that is killing the present and the future of Ukraine's children. Let us help the, its defenseless victims together. Signed in Vilnius and Warsaw, 2nd of March, 2022. And in the end, uh, uh, additionally, let me thank here Pope Francis for today's message addressed to Poles, and I quote, you were the first to support Ukraine, opening your borders, your hearts, and the doors of your homes. You generously offered them everything they need to live with uh, dignity, despite the drama of the present moment, end of quote. And I dedicate those words especially to the delegates of Belarus and others disseminating the false accusers, accusations.
Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished re delegate of representative of Poland. And now I g give the floor to the distinguished representative of New Zealand. Thank you, Mr. President. New Zealand did not intend to take the floor today, believing that our co-sponsorship spoke for itself. However, on hearing the statements of some others, we felt compelled to speak. Let me be clear. New Zealand co-sponsored and voted yes in support of today's resolution of our own free will. We felt no pressure. We felt no pressure because the facts of the situation are clear. Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia violated the central tenets of the UN Charter. Innocent lives are being lost as we speak. The humanitarian consequences are already unimaginable. This war was entirely preventable and the direct result of Russia's unprovoked and unjustified actions. So now it's time for Russia to exercise its free will, to use its free will to cease military operations and permanently withdraw from Ukraine, to act consistently with international obligations, to take all possible steps to protect civilians in line with international humanitarian law, to return to diplomatic negotiations as a pathway to resolve this conflict, and to respect the views of the 141 member states who voted today in solidarity with Ukraine and with the UN Charter. And to our UN colleagues, we say that we must ensure that the adoption of this resolution is not the end of the General Assembly's active engagement in this conflict. We must continue to work to stop the senseless violence and loss of life and put the weight of the international community behind the humanitarian response in Ukraine and its neighborhood. Finally, we do acknowledge that, sadly, this is not the only conflict or humanitarian crisis facing the world today. We hope that today's resolution becomes a galvanizing moment, not only across the breadth of global conflicts, but a galvanizing moment where we, as member states, recommit to multilateralism and the international rules-based order as the primary means to resolve our differences. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of New Zealand. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Colombia. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The resolution that was approved with an absolute majority of 141 votes in favor and only five against is historic on many counts, as has been mentioned during the course of the day. The spontaneous applause that followed the vote was not an applause in favor of war. It was an applause celebrating the triumph of international law, and it was a reaffirmation of the right of all peoples to live in peace with the guarantee of their territorial integrity, their sovereignty, and their political independence. Colombia asks all countries here present to fully implement what we have decided. This requires political will on all of our parts and specific actions and concrete commitments that will put an end to the suffering and fear of millions of Ukrainians, European citizens, and also Russian citizens given the consequences of the senselessness of a unilateral, illegal, and unjustified aggression. This vote was not against the people of Russia, which is a people which in the past has made very valuable contributions to humanity and to the building of the international architecture in areas such as aviation, space exploration, satellites, in engineering, chemistry, medicine, physics, not to speak of culture, music, and the arts. This 
vote today was an overwhelming vote against a leadership deliberately that has decided to put itself on the wrong side of history through personal and delirious nostalgia for an imperial past that will not return because democ democratic sit and free citizens of the world and those of Russia itself do not want it to. This impressive majority of votes in favor of the resolution, and we would like for this to thank all of the technical experts and uh, diplomats from all our delegations uh, for bringing this about, uh, is a universal condemnation of this aggression as we need to recover um, millions of SMEs and uh, millions of jobs that will provide food and schools and housings for hundreds of millions of people uh, throughout the planet that were lost due to a heartless pandemic that has lasted over two years. In the past, we've seen the uh, what can happen when a, a government m moves above the heads of citizens and the law. We cannot allow a person to lead the Russian people and the Ukrainians uh, towards fratricide. As a representative of Laos said this morning, uh, someone is forcing brothers to kill themselves kill each other, and none of us can be a simple spectator of that. We must call unanimously for dialogue, and Colombia therefore calls for the immediate creation of a group of countries that will support negotiation and provide mediation, provided that an immediate end is put to the occupation and military offensive and that the uh, bombings of Ukraine um, are stopped, leading to loss of lives and uh, destruction of infrastructure and hopes and dreams so that we can achieve progress and peace. This is what we all need. On behalf of the President uh, and the people of Colombia, we express our condolences to India, China, Romania, Russia, and those countries whose nationals have been innocent victims of this conflict. None of these people um, put up with a pandemic of two years duration to put up now with this madness. Colombia has a clear rejection, position of rejection of uh, violence, um, because by uh, th this cannot create a precedent and it cannot lead to the uh, later recognition of the facts on the basis of something clearly illegal. Uh, Colombia will uh, undertake mediation and negotiation uh, in this body to build under the auspices of the Secretary General, uh, but this is urgent. We need trust measures that will help to solve the differences between Ukraine and Russia. It's known that violations of human rights give rise to crimes against uh, uh, humanity or genocide, and they cannot go unpunished. And those responsible for these facts will not find peace on the earth, because sooner or later they will have to face international justice through the International Criminal Court. Today, once again, it's clear that uh, all regions of the world are concerned about stability of countries and regions in the world. This is important, uh, irrespective of size and wealth. The security of inhabitants of each region of the planet is fundamental. The fear of what's happening in Asia and Africa is important. The fear of this being a precedent in Europe is important. And for us in Latin America, that has been a region of peace without conflicts between brothers. Um, what has been happening over the last week is important to us, and we are not prepared to see a change in the political balance that is now shaking the entire world and could become a serious mass um, a threat to uh, Latin America and uh, the entire Latin American region. The entire American region. Colombia offers all of its efforts at mediation for this uh, reason, and we ask that an urgent group be formed that can help to solve the differences between Ukraine and Russia and ensure full uh, compliance with the Minsk agreements under the condition that they immediately stop these military actions. This is the genuine test of uh, why we convened in this uh, special assembly. We're not here simply for formal reasons or to hold speeches. But we are here because we are committed to the truth and we are prepared to provide real solutions for world 
peace with a clear, unequivocal message. Illegality will not be tolerated ever again by the community of nations. It's known that these violations have been rejected in various fora at the same time. Today, the United Nations is not acting alone. It's do we saw that in Montreal this morning in the, uh, in uh, the IAEA in Vienna. Tomorrow, it will be the case in the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Next week, in the uh, International Court of Justice in The Hague. In all of these scenarios, the international community is stepping up to confirm uh, that uh, this is a transgression of international law on the part of Russia. That's why Colombia asked the Secretary General of the United Nations to contact the presidents of Ukraine and Russia to create this mediation group uh, and that all efforts be undertaken towards dialogue mediation so that in that way the Secretary General is able to communicate to the world uh, soon that the military operation has been suspended. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished Vice, Vice President and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Colombia for her statement. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Indonesia. Mr. President, our action today sends a clear and bold message that all countries, without exceptions, must respect the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of others. Should all members abide by the UN Charter and international law, the situation in Ukraine would be different. Today, the people of Ukraine is suffering. Innocent lives have been lost in vain. Thousands have been wounded hundreds of thousands displaced. We must ask ourselves, do we want to see the situation continue? For Indonesia, the answer is crystal clear. We must put this war to an end. We must put forward a peaceful resolution through dialogue and diplomacy. We must put safety and the well-being of civilians as our utmost priority. For these reasons, Indonesia has pursued to ensure that humanitarian aspect to be a focus of today's resolution. Safe passage for all civilians must be established. This is to allow and facilitate a rapid, safe, and unhindered access for humanitarian assistance. Mr. President, to bring peace to Ukraine, we must move beyond condemnation and march towards restoring trust and confidence. We understand that the resolution is not perfect, but it is our hope that it provides an opening to give a peace a chance for all parties. Once again, let's give maximum chance for dialogue and diplomacy to succeed. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Indonesia. We have heard the last speaker in statements after the adoption. In accordance with the terms of paragraph 16 of the resolution adopted during our morning meeting, the 11th emergency special session of the General Assembly is temporarily adjourned.